I suspect, given you're watching this, you would consider yourself to be a moral person or maybe an ethical person. So what even is the difference? It turns out there's a lot of difference and it means everything if we're here to live well. The funny thing is, before Eric Jamper Anderson and I recorded this episode, we were talking about this very question and I worried, maybe not didn't worry, but I had this question of, will our listeners and viewers find this an interesting and engaging topic? Isn't it just a little bit kind of heady and academic? It turned out to be such a rich and I would say important conversation. It even surprised me. I think if you are someone who considers themselves to be moral or indeed ethical, you're going to find this absolutely fascinating. Let's dive in. Hello, Eric, a huge welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me back. It's great to see you. Oh, my pleasure entirely. It's taken us a while to start recording what with catching up about important things like dogs. <laughs> Indeed, very important things, yeah. <laughs> so we have got uh, a what, I, what really was already opening up into one of those conversations that you're like, ah, oh, this is probably more than an episode in itself. <laughs> um, the all sorts of things around sort of deconditioning from our modern world view, particularly for those of us that are really feeling called to that animistic world view, uh, the mythical world view. And we originally talked about this through the lens of morality versus relationships, how mm -hmm. part of that modern worldview, Western worldview, whatever you want to call it, call it is this idea that there can be rules and morals that tell us how to live a good life, how to be a good person. And when we start to move more towards a uh, animistic worldview, that no longer makes sense. That's no longer something to navigate by, at least not in the same way, but there is a kind of, there is a letting go of that. That doesn't happen naturally. It seems to me there is something we need to intentionally attend to in order to be able to look at things, I guess, through sort of clearer eyes. So I'd love to start there. When, when you, we talk about this idea of morality, what, what does that mean for you? Why, why do you feel that that's the thing that's in the way? Yeah, so I mean, morals are, are a very interesting thing. And there's been a lot of thinkers, a lot of philosophers that have you know, waxed poetic on morals uh, and all of the different sort of complications of how they arise and how we relate to them for a very long time. Uh, Nietzsche especially wrote on the genealogy of morals, uh, which is actually, I think, a really important piece of work for people to familiarize themselves with, to understand how our morals come into being. Um, maybe we can come back to that in a bit. But morals can be differentiated from ethics in uh, a sort of distinct way. We often use those words interchangeably, but they really aren't entirely interchangeable. Uh, morals are far more subjective. Uh, they're, you know, the sort of beliefs and standards and, and principles that we hold uh, about what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, uh, that really derives from our own <clears throat> subjective, you know, personal and cultural and religious and social values. Uh, and this was really Nietzsche's point fundamentally is that we get the morals that we deserve in the sense that the things that we deem to be moral are generally the things that we're already accustomed to valuing. They're the mm -hmm. things that we're already doing based on the ways that we already live. So they end up being incredibly subjective, incredibly personal, and not necessarily something that is rooted in reason and logic in very many ways. And it's certainly not based, at least not usually, in relationship. Uh, the most common form of, of sort of moral frameworks that we're used to, especially in a religious context, are these sort of systems of what's called vertical morality. So these, mm -hmm. these morals that are sort of imposed upon us from above. They're rules or laws which are given to us by some kind of divine force. And that is then what we follow because they're divine laws. Uh, and that's, that's the end of it. There's no necessary sort of logic to them. Uh, they don't need to be rooted in suffering or reducing suffering. They just need to exist in some sort of sanctified 
text uh, or some tradition of, of knowledge, and then we follow those rules, usually with a promise of then getting some kind of reward or avoiding some kind of punishment. So this idea of morals is, I think, it's what we're used to. And I think even for folks that, you know, are raised in certain religious traditions and then leave them to go and explore other spiritual paths, like an animistic path, uh, we sometimes expect to find similar constructs there. And we, you know, might reconstruct them and put different rules in place, but we still think like, oh, this is a, a religious system, so it must have a set of rules that I need to follow in order to avoid something bad yeah. happening after I die. Yes. And yeah, yeah, that yeah. is not the case. Mm. Would you, you made the distinction just then between uh, morality and ethics. Would you also talk about that? Because I think you're right, we lump all of these things together. And there's something delightfully counterintuitive about this conversation in that we typically think, you know, morals are good. We talk about, you know, someone having good morals. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think we hold that synonymous with a good person. Yeah. Um, and you say we sort of blur these these different ideas of rules, conditioning, ethics, morals. They're not really examined because I think we're probably discouraged to a large extent from examining them. Absolutely. And so I think just teasing apart the, the definitions of these things, I think, is um, helpful. But again, I, I like like the kind of counterintuitive thing, like something that we deem generally as being this is a good thing. We're like, hmm, let's let's just back up and have a look at it. Like, is it? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then there's also something I'm, I'm delighting about the way you're saying, you know, it isn't it isn't built on logic and reason. And then there's something about the way that you're saying, if we look at it through the lens of logic and reason, that's almost like a doorway into relationship, which you again seem quite counter. Um, yeah. Yeah. So going back to how would you how would you define ethics, and then what would be really helpful if possible is to give an example of of one versus the other. Hmm. Yeah. So I mean, ethics. <clears throat> there's a lot of ways to discuss these these concepts, obviously. Um, but one way that we can differentiate between them is that ethics generally tend to have some of the same sort of fundamental characteristics of exploring what's quote unquote right and wrong. But it does so from a somewhat more s sort of systematic and reasoned uh, approach. So the sorry, my cat is a. Uh, wanting to come up here. Come here, sweetie. <laughs> um, ethics are going to be, I think, most usefully determined on the basis of uh, the experience of suffering. So you can determine whether, and whether you use suffering or some other sort of litmus test, there has to be some basis for determining whether something is ethical or unethical, which doesn't just come from scripture. It doesn't just come from sort of cultural tradition and our you know, underlying pre-existing social values. Uh, it needs to be grounded in something somewhat different. Uh, so I, I think the, you know, the most common sort of basis for ethics in a, a sort of philosophical sphere is going to be suffering. So something which causes suffering, especially undue suffering, uh, that's going to be something that's deemed unethical, uh, whereas something that alleviate suffering or doesn't cause suffering would then be ethical. Uh, and of course, this is different from morals. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of the religious morals, especially that, or even just the, the cultural morals that we follow, a lot of them have nothing to do with whether or not someone suffers. Uh, you know, speaking of examples, a great example, especially as a, as a gay man, is the ethics of, you know, sexuality or the, the morals of, of sexuality. There's a lot of people who believe that it is immoral to be gay, which is an absurd idea. But it makes sense when you recognize that, you know, these systems of morality are basically just lists of rules, which are determined at some point in history, but attributed to some kind of a divine source, or at least some overarching kind of, you know, authority. And then we're expected to live by those rules. But those rules don't have to be rooted in the causation of harm or suffering mm -hmm. in any way. They're just, they're just rules. Uh, they're, they're social values, which are then codified in a system of morals. Uh, but ethics, you know, causing harm to others, you know, uh, sexual abuse, sexual, you know, uh, sexual violence, and also violence in general, uh, you know, obviously towards humans, but also arguably towards non-humans. Uh, that can be analyzed as ethical or unethical based on whether it's, you know, causing suffering. So if you're causing suffering to another being, then, you know, on the basis of a of, of sort of rational approach to ethics, that would be unethical. 
However, you can have many situations in which it would be deemed moral by certain moral standards because our morals are subjective. You know, what you and I might call a good person with good morals isn't necessarily what the next person is going to see as a good person with good morals. You know, mm -hmm. we might see someone as very moral and, and very good and someone else sees them as entirely immoral and bad. Uh, you know, I, I think of myself as a relatively moral person, but there's a massive number of people in the world that think that I'm fundamentally immoral on the basis of, you know, being married to a man or uh, being Buddhist sort of, or being you know, any of the things that I am. So it's it's complicated, but we, we have to recognize first and foremost that moral morality is very much a subjective thing uh, and that it really just arises based on what we're used to. So if we want to change our morals, we have to change our values. And if we want to change our values, we have to change the ways that we live. Yes, I, I love this so much. So I'm recognizing, just like with the example you gave about being gay and how through one lens that could be seen as immoral, from another lens, it's got nothing to do with ethics. And I was like, sometimes it's um, not as clear cut. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking, the, one of the examples, I, I noticed this come up for me fairly often, that because of, because of sort of being on a sort of magical shamanic path, I notice that there's people kind of in my circle who are much more kind of, you know, uh, traditional religious types, who that is seen as immoral. Yeah. Involved in, mag in magic is seen yeah. as something that is wrong. And... Yeah that comes into my awareness now and again it's so, so interesting you think you know like you yeah, like consider myself as, <laughs> as this moral person and yet for them that part of me isn't um and i was also thinking you and i were talking about um our own journey around our relationships to animals veganism vegetarianism things like that and i was thinking that's another example where certain religions would say it's immoral to say for example eat animals mm -hmm. others don't and then there's an ethical component so it's a blur isn't it? it depends where that's coming from where the choice is coming from it isn't inherently yeah. moral or not right right and i mean this is this is one of the places where relationship i think really comes in and this was an argument that was made I was introduced to this argument, I think, primarily besides kind of sensing it when I first deconstructed uh, from from Christianity, because I was raised nominally Christian, left it very early at like 12 years old. Uh, and this was one of the sort of sticking points for me was a real concern with the ways that morality and ethics were were negotiated in Christianity, because Christianity is a great example of, of a religious tradition that has a vertical system of morals. Uh, those morals are given by the Christian God, uh, by the Abrahamic God, and you follow them because he said to follow them. And this is, of course, this model it extends far beyond the religious sphere because it arises out of our cultural traditions and our ways of organizing society. And then it also impacts our moving forward, our societies and our, our ways of constructing them and so on. So we have, you know, we live in worlds where we imagine that that's sort of the way that everything works. There's someone in charge, uh, usually a man, and he's usually, you know, he's the single authority for everything and everyone. And he determines what's good and what's bad. And it's our job as the Sort of serfs that are beneath him to follow those rules and if we follow the rules well then we'll be rewarded if we don't follow the rules then we're punished and that punishment is just uh, regardless of how disproportionate it might be you know for for you know there's plenty of people that think because i'm gay i will burn in hell for eternity and because that's based on what they think their god's rules are they think that it's entirely just uh likewise i mean you know the first of the ten commandments is you know not to kill and yet you know the the, the god of the christian bible kills around 2.3 million people in the pages of that text and that's entirely justifiable because he's the one that decides the rules so he can't ever break them because he's the one that chooses it so this is a, a vertical system of morality it's not a universal system of ethics. There's no logical foundation for it. It's strictly based in, okay, what does the rule say? And he's fine. He's exempt. But for the rest of us, you, you have to follow this rule. Otherwise, you're punished. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different sort of approach. But the, Can the, I just the, uh, interrupt briefly here? Yeah. Because 
what's um what's arising for me is in fact as you were talking you as you were describing it the uh hierophant uh Tarek, if you're watching on video yeah. guys if i can line it up i was just really thinking i can't keep this hold it straight um the hierophant card in tarot is just such a perfect archetype and symbol for everything you've just been yeah. talking about and that i think is much of the conditioning that is infusing where we're taking this idea of like this is how how i'm meant to get this structure but the interesting contemplation for me having not been raised in any sort of religious um construct that's obvious is mm. where is that in me where is the hierophant in my psyche because yeah. my senses is in all of ours just because that's our culture but i think it's harder to see than if you've had that direct obvious experience that like you have yeah i'd love to hear your thoughts on that because i think it's for many of us um that haven't been raised in a religious setting much of what mm. you're saying might be like well i don't think that is the case for me yeah yeah, I mean, it is one of those things where it's, you know, uh, very few of us, not very few of us, it's a, a distinct experience to be able to recognize it overtly in our lives and respond to it and critically analyze it and deconstruct it and let go of it. But it is, it underlies a lot of our modern social constructs globally. Obviously, I mean, the ways that we approach law are in part uh, arising from the same sort of impulses mm. as these sort of religious constructs. Uh, not all laws are based on ethics. You know, I mean, look, no, at, look at drug laws, you know, excellent example mm. of that, especially in places like the United States, where the majority of people that are incarcerated for, you know, something like marijuana possession are people of color. Uh, while at the same time, you have folks like, you know, John Boehner and other like, you know, senior politicians, including right wing politicians who are now making millions off of legal marijuana. And it's not about an it's not an ethical question, even though they'll mm. often make it seem like it is. Oh, you know, drug use leads to violence and leads to these terrible things. And it doesn't matter if there's no evidence supporting that, especially for a drug like marijuana. Uh, but they still will try to make sense of it and sort of justify it. But at the end of the day, it's not an ethical question. Uh, it's, it's just a, a question of morals uh, and sort of social values of a particular time and place, which are then turned into this sort of legal system that has real effects on people's lives. And oftentimes, you know, for those people, there's a sense of like, why, why does this happen? Have to impact my life in this way. Mm. Uh, there's no ethical dimension to this. There's plenty of victimless crimes uh, that, you know, we, we have these laws in place to protect usually rich people's assets and to create circumstances where certain people can be victimized and alienated by the powers that be, uh, while other people generally don't have to worry about it as much. Um, but this is a, a good example of how this kind of mindset seeps into our, our, our societies and very uh subtle ways and it's important that we question those along with just this fundamental idea that the way that the universe is structured is that there is someone in charge and they have made everything in a certain way and our job in our lives you know for some people the sole purpose of life is to understand those rules and to follow them mm -hmm. and this this mentality is quite dangerous this is something that you know nietzsche himself was really he was really critical of was this sort of mentality that arrived rises from specifically Judaism and Christianity, uh, and later to an extent Islam. Um, but this sort of mentality, even that, you know, it is moral to be powerless, uh, to mm -hmm. follow the rules, to be sort of um, dis not disenfranchised, yes, disenfranchised, uh, but to be sort of, you know, meek, the idea that the meek yeah. shall inherit the earth. That is, mm -hmm. we think of this as a, a good moral principle. But if you think about the fact that it also really benefits people who are in power, and are not meek and they have all of the power and they want to retain the power what's the best way that you can convince people to stay in their lane you tell them that actually that lane down there the one where you're struggling more and you don't have that much power that is the moral lane that you should be very happy about because you'll be at the right hand side of the lord in heaven and you'll have all of these rewards after you die isn't that wonderful so everyone says oh yeah that's great wonderful i'll stay with this because this is what it means to live a good life while the people who actually have the power in the 
resources. They're not giving them up anytime soon. You know, it's no one's uh, rushing to to sacrifice all of their privileges, even if they do claim to adhere to the same sort of moral principles, because it ultimately benefits those who are already in positions of power. So this was. Mm-hmm. You know, this was an argument that that Nietzsche made that I think is really worth paying attention to, in addition to this recognition that our morals aren't some kind of like well thought out revelation. It's just what arises from our values and our values are just the things that we're used to doing and that we associate ourselves with, which I think also really gets down to even for those um I think even especially potentially those that are outside of the sort of dominant, you know, mainstream Western religious traditions, including Buddhism, uh, there is still an obsession with being a good person. And that's something that we should always be, I think, a little bit critical of because we can easily manipulate our, our values and our morals to make it so that the way that we behave is just automatically moral because we like doing it that way and we want to be a good person. Mm. So in order to maintain our goodness, we just manipulate the structure a little bit and we justify our behaviors and our values instead of really questioning uh, in every moment with every decision, what is the ethical thing for me to do? And recognizing that sometimes we have to do things that are unethical and we should be able to sit with that and recognize that, stay with the trouble, as Donna Haraway Mm. would say, instead of immediately trying to cover it up and come up with some kind of way to justify it yeah yes this is um really i think it's the heart of if we are if we are saying if we do see ourselves as someone that's devoted to the path of truth of the the path of being conscious of how we are thinking living being these are the questions that we need to be asking of ourselves, but so easily again, because the conditioning has us, the dog society to leave us, the conditioning has us not want to do, like it, again, yeah. it's, it's the part of the conditioning is to not examine, yeah. to, as you say, orientate, like all I need to do is get better at following the rules, then I'll be a good person. And it was, as, as you were saying about um, laws and government, I was thinking, yes, it's interesting because that has become the the sort of modern face of the hierophant in that is like the government and all the laws around that um have become that power instead but interestingly certainly in the west how that is still interwoven with religion isn't it yeah it isn't it isn't a separate kind of thing that's bereft of any um any of the ideas that have come from say christianity they're interwoven yeah um which I think is, is really helpful to recognize, like it's still the same symbol, just taken on a different uh, guise. So would you, would you say that ethics are what naturally arises from relationship? Is that, what, is that a, a, a facet that you see or a manifestation that just is naturally occurring when we're in relationship? Yeah, I think I think to an extent the real fundamental difference, you know, I I usually explain it like this, you know, we generally, you know, like I I don't want to harm my husband. I wouldn't want to hurt him in any way. I wouldn't, you know, he's really hurting you, not letting you have a dog. (laughs) Come on, it's fair. The other cheek on this one, Eric. Touche, touche. To be fair, he's not. It's not that he's. He's not that he's not allowing me to have a dog. Kind of. He's just delaying the, the timing so that he says we can have a dog in the future. He's he's offering me the reward in heaven, basically. Okay. So I have to follow the rule. Um, touche. These are some good uh, good things for me to ponder. No, he's. Uh, but but the reason that I wouldn't want to harm him is because I don't want him to suffer. That's that's the fullest extent of the reason. It's not because it's illegal to harm him it's not because it's immoral to harm him it's not that i don't i wouldn't harm him because i don't want to um, be punished for harming him it's that i don't want him to suffer and that's really that's the the turning point that's the real fundamental difference and it's because of that that i would never harm him but the same thing goes for my neighbors the same thing goes for you know a random person that i see walking down the street same thing certainly goes for animals you know the reason that i don't want to harm an animal or the reason that I wouldn't just go up to a stranger and punch them in the face isn't that it's illegal. It's specifically that I just don't want them to suffer. And that's a far more compelling 
um, motivation, I think, for human beings especially, because that's what really motivates our behavior. That's what really inspires us and enchants us and drives us is relationship. So this really comes, you know, it, it brings us to these questions about like, how do we deal with the big issues that we're facing right now in the world, both in regards to our social crises and also in regards to the, our planetary crises? is how do we actually motivate a shift in behavior? Do we do it by simply creating new rules? I, I think that there's logic and, and reason in that. I think it's important for us to have uh, you know, really robust climate legislation. I think it's, uh, it would be excellent if we have you know, better legislation internationally against ecocide uh, and having a legal framework for these things is really useful. But is that alone going to actually impact the ways that we behave or are we just going to find loopholes to get around it? Because we kind of like, that's what we do. We love loopholes. Uh, you know, if there's a rule in place that especially isn't car causing anyone in our immediate vicinity immediate harm, then a lot of people will just find loopholes to work around it. The only way that you can really compel people to actually change their behavior is by getting them to care. And that's the point that arises in relationship. That's what arises through genuine, empathic, engaged relationship with others is care. And that's what we need. If we don't have that, then the rest of the stuff really isn't going to do anything. It's just lip service. Uh, it's just falling into the same mentality that, oh, we just need, you know, these sort of better moral frameworks. But unless our morals are arising from our values and our values are arising from the ways we live, then we're just going to find ways around them. It's not really going to compel anyone to change. Yeah, I was just pondering as you were, as you were saying that about you know, is it is it a good idea to also have rules? Um, what I was wondering is what the ways that sometimes those rules, which you know are you know become morals, actually get in the way of forming relationship. Oh, they, absolutely. They create this barrier to be able to, that's in the way of being becoming intimate, becoming open, becoming vulnerable, actually creating yeah. a reciprocal relationship. It's like, how do you how do you um, have that sense of relationship to to something or someone that's on this other side of a rule? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, I, I think absolutely. It, it can be a major hindrance in actually creating a genuine sense of care and empathic relationship, even forms of these kinds of frameworks that we think of as being quite innocuous. I mean, karma, I think, is a great example of this, because, you know, in theory, you know, the great thing about Buddhist ethics is that there is a foundation in the causation of suffering. There's an acknowledgement that in general, something is unethical if it causes suffering to another sentient being. And the the ethic of, you know, being a, a so-called good person is to try to avoid causing suffering. That on its own, if that were strictly motivated by the cultivation of compassion and love and care, I think that could be really compelling and very robust. But it becomes a little bit more complicated when karma gets involved, especially in the ways that we talk about karma conventionally, which is if I do something bad to someone else, then something bad is going to happen to me. And therefore, the reason that I shouldn't do something bad to someone else is because I don't want Want something bad to happen to me. Mm. And I think that that can be incredibly limiting. Uh, and it's really, you know, if that's the only reason that you're not causing harm to someone, you're not a good person. <laughs> like, that's not, you know, if the, it's like if the only reason you're not, you know, going out and, and shooting people is that you don't want to go to prison then there's some problems there. Like yeah. you, you probably have some stuff that you need to sort out because that that shouldn't be the only roadblock in place. Uh, we should be able to <clears throat> naturally compel ourselves not to do those things because strictly we don't want others to suffer. So, mm. you know, I think really in any of these frameworks, which are often, I think, cultivated out of a, a sense of necessity to create societies where people aren't going around killing each other and stealing from each other and doing all these atrocious things, so for ostensibly noble reasons, but then when that becomes the sort of basis that we view the world through and that we approach ethics through, I think it's incredibly limiting. Uh, and it really, it stops us from actually being able to actively negotiate mm -hmm. our place in the world and our relationships with others, 
which is we we need that we need that complex kind of negotiation especially right now when the issues that we're facing are so complex they're so often sort of amorphous and you know out there and uh, somewhat inaccessible to our daily lived experience depending on where you're living that it's hard for us to really deal with them in an effective way so it requires more nuance and and unfortunately we we don't get a lot of nuance from religion because it's a system of, of answers and all you have to do is look up the answer. Uh, it's not a system of questions. It's not a path of inquiry in the same way that spirituality, quote unquote, spirituality is or philosophy. Yes. I just was, I was just pondering what you were saying there about kind of nuance and the places that we've typically looked don't have, don't even, it's not even necessarily, they don't hold the answer, they do hold the answers. But as you were saying before we started recording, like generally religion isn't a great tool for the, for the jobs that are kind of really most pressing for us to yeah. engage in as humans. And I was thinking just again, how it's not just that those, um, you know, religion, law, aren't especially nuanced. It's like we just don't do well with nuance as humans. Certainly, again, talking about us in a more modern worldview and how even the idea of opening to something that is beyond morals and takes us into that question of relationship and ethics can can be threatening. I was just I was almost doing a thought experiment myself just then thinking of the places where um, I perhaps slightly like um, mindlessly do things and it's like opening into Oh, you know, it could be the food chain, for example, where it's mm. like whilst, you know, I am, there's parts of that that I, I am very much kind of like consciously in relationship to parts of, you know, the food chain that arrives to me. There's other mm. parts where there's, you know, grief and fear and a kind of sense of overwhelm that arises as there's parts of me that looks at this aspect and thinks, oh, my goodness, to be in relationship with all the aspects that make up that part of the process is a lot. It's quite, yeah. You know, it, it's asking a lot of me. It's quite overwhelming. And yeah. so I'd love to, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that because again, this isn't, this isn't straightforward. This isn't a kind of like, okay, so all we need to do is orientate ourselves towards relationship. Right. And then the ethics, it's just like, it's a lot to be in relationship to, and yeah. it's asking a lot of us. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the complexities of living in the modern world with like mm. free market capitalism and, you know, global commerce and all of these really extensive and massive systems of exploitation that we're usually not entirely privy to. Mm. You know, we might have an idea of them, but we don't generally see them firsthand. We don't have a real sense of the actual human and non-human cost of these systems. And it's easy enough and it's socially acceptable enough, it's moral enough based on our, you know, our values to just go to the store and buy something which is created through slave labor, it's created through the exploitation of animals, imprisonment, torture, etc. And it's, it's fine, you can do it. I can go there to this store, it looks very pretty, and you know, nice smiling person, I give them my card and they give me the thing and it's fine, it must be fine because it's so easy and so straightforward for us to do it. So but normal. there's... Yeah, it's so it's we become accustomed to it, you know, this and this is the classic, like, it's the way that we're used to living. So we value it. And then we just align our morals to those pre existing values so that we can be good people. Just and the, good citizen. You, we're just being a good citizen. Precisely. And we're being good consumers. You know, we're that and that's really, uh, it's problematic, because it's not that simple. And unfortunately, to live in a world with this much complexity and this much syst systematic exploitation, mm. we unfortunately have to really negotiate that if we want to, you know, live in the world as mindful, you know, sort of spiritual people or as folks that are on a path to some kind of liberation in whatever form that might take for us, uh, who are trying to make a positive impact on the world. We have to ask these questions. We have to deal with these, uh, these complexities. And these aren't necessarily the same kinds of things that people were having to negotiate a thousand years ago or five thousand years ago or twenty thousand years ago uh, they had a far more intimate and direct relationship with you know the the places that they get their food and different resources quote-unquote resources and uh and so on 
So we have a lot more on our plate because the world that we live in is a lot more complex uh, and because it's so easy for us to put the blinders on. It was a lot harder for most people in most traditional societies uh, to have blinders because you're just confronted with the reality every day. You're in direct relationship. Uh, And also there was always, you know, a kind of openness before these systems of, again, the, the moral frameworks in the sense of being a good person, being a bad person. I think there was a bit more comfort with the the ambiguity of it all. You know, sometimes mm. we do do things that are wrong, that are unethical, that cause harm to others. Sometimes it's necessary for us to do things that are unethical. And recognizing that and accepting that and recognizing that actually some of the things that I do are not are not good. They are unethical. They cause suffering. What can I do to remedy that? That's a far more powerful kind of conversation, I think, than just, oh, well, I do it. Therefore, I need to find a way to justify it and say that it's not wrong. This is ultimately, I mean, for me, this is the, and I, I make this point in my book as well, Unseen Beings, for anyone that doesn't know. Um, <laughs> is, you know, we, we really... Um... You did that plug so naturally. Like, Thank you. I, didn't know, no. I just didn't notice. <laughs> just blows right out. <laughs> um, you know, the, the real big issue with the way that we approach animal agriculture in, in the modern, modern, air quotes for all of this, modern Western world, but also global commerce and, you know, just modernity as a whole, the way that we deal with animal agriculture is not that we find ways to justify it as a moral necessity. It's that we completely remove it from the sphere of morality altogether. Mm -hmm. It becomes amoral. It doesn't become moral or immoral. It's amoral. You know, a lot of people will make the argument that actually, you know, there is no moral dimension to the way that we get our food. To nourish ourselves, to feed ourselves, Anything is justified. You can do basically anything. And people say this a lot. And of course, they don't mean it because you can easily then go in and say, well, what about cannibalism? And they'll immediately have a response. No, that's wrong because it's people. Yeah, it's human people. Sure. But then you, we have to acknowledge that that's where we're drawing the line. It's still just plain old anthropocentrism. It's not some special catch-all rule that as long as you're eating something, it doesn't matter what you've done to that being. That's That's not the case. It's just that most people in the modern sort of Western kind of world uh, are have this very instrumentalist view of non-humans and a very anthropocentric moral framework. And Mm -hmm. that is problematic in traditional societies, not all, but the vast majority, almost all indigenous societies and the vast majority of pre-modern and non-modern societies had a very different approach to animal husbandry and animal agriculture. Even in societies in which animals were routinely killed, either through hunting or fishing, uh, which is a very different kind of thing, uh, or through actual, you know, animal, you know, livestock raising and animal agriculture in a more conventional sense, there was still often a sense that that those animals are living beings. They are persons in their own way. They have feelings. They have their own values. They have their own desires and needs. And we are in relationship to them. It's just that that relationship sometimes involves violence which is a form of relationship. And in my view, recognizing that is heads and shoulders above saying, no, it's not violence because they're not people. It, they don't matter. They don't have, there's no value in non-human life. Therefore, we don't actually have to worry very much about how we treat them or what happens to them. It's amoral. That's a very problematic sort of position that feeds very well into the capitalist ontology of constantly increasing, 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 increasing production until the world ends, which is precisely what's going to happen. Uh, but that that feeds into it very nicely. It's just, you know, as long as you can sustain the exploitation for, uh, you know, many generations, then it's moral. Uh, that's a completely different conversation than what used to take place in human societies Mm. i couldn't agree more the what's occurring to me um i'd love your thoughts on this it's i think first of all as you're saying you know just to be honest about the my cat wants to get out one second (laughs) there we are (laughs) sorry (laughs) um to be honest about 
the ways that we have got that cognitive dissonance as a, as a form of protection. Again, you know, it's there's a lot of complexity, a lot of very challenging uh, choices if we were to consciously engage with them as choices that we need to make to live in this modern world. Mm. Um, but to begin to be honest about it does open door to something. And what I was pondering just then in terms of like, what what is that something? Those of us that are, again, you know, consciously on that path of, let's call it individuation, a really important aspect of that is to see what's kind of like not yet been seen, to be in that yeah. work of reclaiming what's in shadow. And I think recognizing that this, this conversation we're in is, is absolutely part of that, is a part that for all the reasons we've said is perhaps less common and mm. is perhaps not the low hanging fruit that we naturally will go through. It's more of like cultural shadows that really that we're looking at, which, yeah. you know, understandably, you know, we've, we've, most of us have got huge amounts of kind of personal stuff that we're going to need to work with before we're even ready to start to grapple with those, those big things. But yeah. I think the more we can recognize, like, ultimately, and this isn't meant as the same way as kind of like, I'm not going to shoot someone only because I'm, I'm not going to go to prison. But I kind of like, I think a way just to even choose to um, open to this is to recognize it's, it's still all in service of our own individuation, our own liberation, our own sense of union. All yeah. of this, everything we talk about also lives inside ourselves. Yeah. And if we can't look at the way that, for example, we are complicit in the ways other humans, animals, the world's being treated, that's part of us. We are pushing away, Absolutely. being blind to. And so I think just to recognize, like it can seem really overwhelming when it's a whole world out there. But if we can just start to relate to like, how is this in me? Yeah. Am I ready to like start to make a relationship with this aspect in me to start to like even yeah. just look at what's there? It feels to me that's a little bit more of a kind of manageable uh, choice for someone to make. Yeah. Well, I, th I think it's, you know, that's an aspect of the sort of mechanics in the Buddhist tradition of karma that I think is actually very important to, to mm. think about and is, has a lot of value. It's not so much the what goes around comes around kind of thing. Mm. The idea is fundamentally that the way that we behave in the world, the way that we live our lives and our, our sort of interface with the world leaves kind of imprints on our our minds on our our sort of you know continuum of consciousness <laughs> so <laughs> that's okay wet children running down the path in the rain <laughs> so if we're if we're accustomed to experiencing the world in a particular way or acting in a certain way or you know always putting our own needs first and putting on the blinders and so on and looking the other way when atrocities are being committed you know partially in our names or with our dollars or with our you know sort of consent uh, that has an impact on the way that we will continue viewing the world into the future those you know so-called karmic imprints help to create our karmic vision and that's what we have to i think be really conscientious of is, you know, if I live my life in a cruel way where I'm really not concerning myself with the welfare of others, I'm putting myself first and always putting everyone else secondary, that's going to continue being reinforced in my frame of reference going forward. You know, the sort of neural pathways are being formed that make that the, the go-to for me. And that'll then impact the way that I perceive the world, the way that I perceive other people, the way that I relate to, um, you know, the love or lack of love that's shown to me by others. So we really do have to take some responsibility for our orientation to the world and recognize that it's it is going to cause us misery not necessarily because if i steal from someone then the rules of karma dictate that someone else is going to steal from me but if my mentality is that i can just go and take whatever it is that i want and that's going to just keep continuing so i'm going to keep stealing 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 that that then becomes my the lens through which i experience reality and i'm going to see that in everyone else i'm going to expect that in everyone 
someone else. That's going to seep into other aspects of my, you know, ontological framework for reality, my philosophies and the stories that I value and my relationships. It's going to end up impacting the way that I feel about myself. So we have to be conscientious of these tendencies, I think, because it does have a dramatic effect on the world that we create, each of us in our own minds, uh, our own personal experience of reality, uh, which is quite subjective and is very much impacted by our past behaviors, values, and ways of living. Mm, I'm really glad that um, we've weaved our way here and uh, perfect timing. We're kind of just coming up to, to the end of the show where, you know, we, you and I, before we began recording, we were asking ourselves, you know, how is this uh, a conversation that is, you know, interesting, relevant to listeners? Like, why would someone want to listen to this? And it's like, whilst both of us felt like it, it's, of course anyone would want to listen to it, like it couldn't be more relevant. I don't think it, it, it is immediately so. It's not necessarily mm. questions that people are uh, have in their minds. But I think where we've ended up, it's like, even if we aren't kind of orientated right now, and again, for all the reasons we've said, for very good reasons, it's a lot to deal with. If we're yeah. not kind of thinking about how do I be in right relationship to animals, you know, the earth, other humans, whatever it is, to recognize like to be in right relationship with ourselves really is, you know, the, if we are living a life in a way that is conscious, has meaning, that's that's what we'd want to orientate towards. And it just happens yeah. to be in so like this beautiful symbiosis. We start to be in right relationships with all parts of ourselves. It just naturally flows out to being in right relationship with everything else. Yeah. Well and, and to the point of, you know, the the be mythical podcast, you know, I, I think a really important piece of this is recognizing if, if we want to change our behavior, which I think most of us do, you know, maybe not all of us are pointing at ourselves individually in that, but we know that collectively humans, especially, you know, modern, quote unquote, modern, quote unquote, Western humans, we have to change. We have to change the ways that we're behaving. We have to change the, the ways that we live and our, our impact on the world. And then the question arises, how do we do that? And I very much think that the way we do that is we need to compel ourselves to care, we need to you know, bring ourselves to a place of cultivating empathy. And I think that the most powerful way for us to do that, in addition to actually being in relationship with others, is through stories, is through myth. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the point that um, that you mentioned earlier that we had talked can about I, before. Can we for a sec? Pre pretend yeah. I asked you, what does it mean to you to be mythical? And then I'll carry on. Oh, good <laughs> question. <laughs> Good question. For me, you know, a myth is a, a story about something important. That's my the, the definition of myth that I work with. It's not a fallacy. It's not a falsehood. It's a story about something important, uh, which to me really speaks to, you know, the thing that we were talking about earlier and the fact that, you know, we all think that religion is the realm of, of the big questions of life. You know, that's where we answer the big questions is in religion. Questions like, how did the universe come into being? Was there a creator of the universe? What are the rules that said creator wants us to live by? What happens after we die? These are not important questions. <laughs> These questions are not, we don't actually have to know the answers to any of those in order to live well on this planet right here and right now. It's not those questions that we need to dedicate ourselves to trying to answer, but we're convinced that they are because that helps the religions, you know, maintain their institutional <laughs> control. But I think really the places that we find the actual important questions and some pathways towards answers is in myth. It's in stories, especially these stories about something important. That's where we really learn not about how to die or how to get to a good afterlife. That's where we learn how to live well. That's how we learn how to be in relationship with others. That's where we learn, you know, what it means to be um, heroic, uh, you know, what it means to love, what it means to sacrifice, what it means to be in community. You know, these are really the kinds of questions that we need answers to right now, each of us in our own lives. And I don't think 
think we can find those in religion. In religion, we'll find someone else's answers to their important questions or what they claim are the important questions. But very rarely does that actually speak to our own lived experiences. We need to, to find the myths and stories that really inspire and enchant us, that give us that sense of living a life worth living, that give us you know, what Campbell calls the rapture of being alive. That's really where our work is. And it's in stories, not just in you know, the Iliad and the Odyssey and the Kalevala and the Mabinogion and things like that. It's also in the films that we watch, the television shows we watch, the, the plays that we watch, the books that we read, the novels and science fiction and fantasy, all of those. They give us insights into what it means to be human and what it means to be alive, both in a time of technological innovation, in social and political upheaval, and also in a more than human world. Those are the kinds of spaces that we can investigate different perspectives on life and also where we can start to cultivate a sense of care and empathy, including for those that are very, very, very different from us that we might not usually engage with in our day-to-day -day lives. But by knowing their stories, by feeling their stories, we can actually cultivate a sense of care for others that is far more compelling and far more world altering than any set of rules that we can ever be given by some God on high. Mm. That's almost a mic drop moment there. <laughs> oh, wow. That was uh, what, what uh, a rich exploration. I, I really enjoyed this conversation yeah, as you too. have. So, um, well, here's your opportunity to mention your book again, which uh, I was joking earlier, but more than OK for you to plug it. Where can listeners find out more about you, your book, everything else that you're up to? Uh, well, my book is called Unseen Beings, How We Forgot the World is More Than Human, uh, and it's available everywhere. You can find it on all, in all the usual places. Uh, but if you want to find out more about it, you can also go to unseen-beings.com uh, or my sort of main website, srimala.com, S-H-R-I-M-A-L-A.com. Uh, and there's a bunch of information there about the book. Uh, there's also an audiobook version. There's a Kindle version. So whatever your preference is. And if anyone is a, is a Swedish speaker, there's also a Swedish translation now, uh, which is available in Sweden. Um, so yeah, and there's I also have the the Unseen Beings podcast now, which I, I very much hope that you'll join me on sometime, uh, where know. we explore what it means to be human in a more than human world. And uh, I have a lot of exciting guests and some also. So yeah, really good conversations there. So if folks are interested, they can learn more at those websites. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, if if listeners haven't already, by the time this one goes out, our first episode together will have gone out. And so definitely catch that one as well, because that was a really juicy conversation that was probably much more um, aligned to the topic of your book, wasn't it? Mm. I'm not saying this one wasn't, but I think the, uh, the first one we did was more directly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Also, if you ever need another job, I think you could be the face of one of those like shopping channels, although you modeled the book there. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. Was Definitely that keep that in mind. <laughs> I can be Vanna White. Just give me a fabulous gown and a wig and I'll be, I'll be great. <laughs> thank you so much that has been uh yeah this has all just been such a joy thank you Eric. no been here. thank you so much for having me i very much hope you enjoyed watching that and if you did and you're not already subscribed then do hit that bell thingy and subscribe to automatically get each fresh new episode as it's released each week if you'd like to find out more about the work we do at Be Mythical to guide and support old souls in this new world to live their own unique myth, do hop along to bemythical.com and you'll find out all the ways you can join us and go deeper with us on your own mythical journey. Lots of love for now. See you again next week.